This is Epicenter, episode 304 with guest David Chom. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Voltoro, the gold hedging platform for the crypto community. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely starting at just one milligram. Go to voltoro.gold slash epicenter to get early access to their V2 platform and to start trading. And by Trail of Bits. Don't leave your project's security audit to just any firm. Trust a team with decades of experience at the forefront of blockchain security research. Go to trailofbits.com to learn more. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Friederike Ernst. Or maybe today, Freddy. Hey, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm going to start calling you Freddy from now on. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Freddy Ernst. How are you doing? I'm fine. We just had a fantastic interview with David Schaum, uh, who is who truly is the godfather of cryptography. And uh, what did you think, Sebastian? I was so excited to do this interview. I mean, we inter- we emailed him, Brian and I, like years ago, before, I think before Maher was even a guest on the podcast, uh, just, just to have him on, like, because he's, he's freaking David Chum, you know? And so it never happened. And now, now that he's working on this, on this new thing, uh, Elixir, I guess maybe he felt that it was more appropriate. Uh, but uh, yeah, we spent like an hour talking to him about, you know, his, his history and his early days at Berkeley, uh, DigiCash, uh, all that stuff. And I think he's just such an insightful person and has a lot of really great ideas and, you know, about personal privacy and, and data sovereignty and, and also is kind of optimistic uh, about where things are heading, which I'm totally not, but it's good to have optimistic people in this space. This was actually what struck me most or what maybe surprised me most. So basically, he's been in this field for such a long time and he thinks it's all going to end well. And uh, to me, that is a great consolation. Yeah, I hope he's right. (laughs) Me too. We initially wanted to also talk more about uh, Elixir, but since the project, it's still evolving, Like, but there's still white papers that need to be written, this sort of thing, and the project hasn't launched yet. We thought that it'd be better to have him back on in some time, whenever they're ready to talk more about uh, about that uh, specifically, so we would go in a bit more technical aspects of that project. So this conversation is mostly just picking David's brain, and so it was really terrific. And so I I really hope that uh, you all will like it. Before we go to the interview, I do want to talk a little bit about Tel Aviv Blockchain Week. As this really is coming out, I am probably heading on a plane to go to Tel Aviv. I'll be at Scaling Bitcoin, and also Ethereal and Starkware Sessions. We've partnered with Starkware Sessions. It's on the 16th on Monday, and you can get 20% off the regular ticket price by using the code Epicenter. And if you want to register, there's t- still tickets available. It's epicenter.rocks slash Starkware. I'm also speaking on a panel on the evening of September 11th. It is entitled The Era of New Rising Chains and Assets. Uh, it is hosted by Zengo and will be moderated by their CEO, Oriel Ohayan. The panel will be uh, Zaki Manian of uh, Tenement and Mason Borda of Tokensoft and myself. So if uh, you're interested in listening to us talk about new rising chains and assets, please register for that. You can register at zengo.rocks slash meetup. So with that, here's our interview with David Chom. We're here with David Chom. David Chom needs no introduction in this space because he really has pioneered and set the stones that are the foundation for a lot of the things that we're building in the blockchain space. And I mean, personally, for me, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to, to have you on just because I'm, I'm so concerned by my own privacy. And a lot of these concepts uh, are concepts that you know, date back to when you were initially working on them and researching them and writing the papers uh, that that put all this stuff in motion. So thank you for joining us today. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Well, thank you, Sebastian. It's, it's, it's great to be here, really. I appreciate it. And thanks for the kind words. Let's start with the beginning. Tell us about your background, 
uh, your time at Berkeley studying computer systems there. And you know, what was it like back then to be working on these technologies? Well, it, you're taking me, taking me back, but uh, you know, this was Berkeley, of course. So it was a very exciting, progressive place. And my office mates and uh, colleagues there were people that, you know, created a lot of famous stuff in the computer science field. You know, I was working in that kind of department and then like Bill Joy and Eric Schmidt and all these people were, you know, people I talked to all the time there and, and everything, Dave Patterson with the risk architecture and a lot of uh, key things were happening then as well as in cryptography. Those were really exciting times for all the real basic uh research and so we had all kinds of people coming through constantly visiting and talking about their research in in cryptography and and so forth so it was um but there was also a kind of um backdrop of most of the graduate students were being recruited to work for the kind of military industrial complex but there were a lot of posters up saying don't do this so there were a lot of ethical issues in the air. I mean, this was Berkeley, uh, it, you know, 77 to like 80 and um, 82. It was, uh, it was a, you know, it was quite a, quite a mix of uh, interesting uh, things going on. So there were, there were some people that were going to work for kind of the government or you know, maybe in industry and then there are others that were kind of opposed to that what were they doing were they most mostly working on research or did they have their own ideas about what they wanted to build i guess you you fell in that second category yes well i believe that my work was as far as i know probably unique in taking advantage of the opportunity to do unconstrained research in order to find a way to use the technology to really advance dramatically the the causes of public interest. So you got a PhD from, from Berkeley with a thesis entitled Computer Systems um, Established, Maintained, and Trusted by Mutually Suspicious Groups, which to anyone who's uh, familiar with uh, cryptocurrency sounds very modern. Um, and if you, if you actually look into this, the thesis puts forward um, a system that bears a lot of the hallmarks of Bitcoin. So basically, you have the cryptographic uh, signatures, you have the peer-to-peer uh, -peer system. You don't have the proof of work, but everything else kind of is there already. So what actually made you interested in these specific systems? This is the most fundamental problem in security of information technology, generally, right? How can you make a computation that can be trusted by a group of people who don't trust each other, and more specifically, each, say, participant should have a, a privacy-protected channel with the computation. The, the, it's based on a published and, and mutually agreed algorithm that the computation is supposed to perform, but all of the state and data in the computation is hidden from everyone. But when the computation speaks publicly or over the secure channels to the individual participants, everyone can be certain that what it is saying is correct. And uh, this is a problem that I recognized early on as being kind of the fundamental issue. You could think of it as the sort of church touring theorem for or conjecture for information security because if you can solve that problem then you i believe can solve any information security problem with that mechanism now that's an unproven conjecture but it's just like you know saying that a Turing machine can do any computation you can't really prove that but it's a conjecture that uh, seems to have, to have held up so that's why I, I was interested in it and i proposed a way to solve it in my dissertation now it's a little bit ironic i guess that my concern about digital sovereignty and all made me not sign the copyright of my dissertation 
over to something called dissertation abstracts that would like like most theses they'd be online and you people could find them over they, you could you could order copies so i kept the copyright and everything for mine so it just basically lived in the library in a paper form there were three copies in three different uh you know parts of the, of the uh, berkeley uh library system but it was never digitized and so it pretty much escaped notice although you know how library books in the old days when there were physical books and you go to the library then they would put a little stamp in a with a date and a, on a little sticker that was kind of on the inside cover of the book or something so you can go back and look at these copies and see that there were instances of when they were checked out and because of the lengths of time that people had them you can make inferences about the type of library status they had so library metadata is a very dangerous <laughs> uh yeah because right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. you could go yeah. you could go back now and you actually look at the library records and find out exactly who read those papers and basically just like figure out exactly who the finite number of people who read that paper pretty much right but so at least from these little stamps you can see that it was checked out occasionally but sometimes people kept it for like a whole year and there are only certain people that are allowed to check out books for a whole year. So that's it. There was, there was it down pretty much, but any event. Yeah. So actually there was a recent paper that is mentioned on my Wikipedia page, the Wikipedia page about me, I guess one should say that is by uh, professor Alan Sherman and others that goes through and I think it provides the best kind of taxonomy and explanation of all the different variants that we've seen in the blockchain space. And it sort of organizes those. And it highlights my contribution. And basically, as you said, Freddie, that's pretty much the only thing that I didn't anticipate in that work was the proof of work. But, you know, there are a lot of other types of consensus mechanisms, as you know. And there's a point I'd like to make about that, which is, I think, worth trying to keep in mind. And that is that back in those days, let's say in 1980, the idea of burning up tons of computing time in order to, for a consensus uh, algorithm was like beyond reasonable. And it wasn't until, I believe, 12 years later or so, about 94, that the idea of burning up uh, time to, you know, to have sort of a, a, a winners who could uh, be the, the next block producer and so on, uh, or the whole idea of using uh, proof of work for anything was proposed by actually one of my co-authors, uh, Monina Orr, and, a, and I, I remember very clearly sitting in the auditorium there where I believe Cynthia Dwork, the other co-author, presented the paper and I, I remember actually where I was sitting and the, you know just thinking about this and wow that's they proposed it in the context of a way to defeat or impede spam email at the time was that a precursor to hash cash you could say that but what, what I'm trying to point out is that the technique was already pretty well known it's just that you had to kind of wait till there was enough computing power and bandwidth and everything out there that any of this kind of stuff would make sense. So to say that someone in 82 didn't fully invent blockchain just because that, that one type of consensus algorithm wasn't included, I don't think that's reasonable. Oh, no, no. And it was very much not meant as a criticism in that sense. I, I was marveling at your foresight that, you know, basically you... No, okay. Yeah. I mean, I should maybe say it in that way. I think maybe differently, put differently, what's really interesting to observe is that there, there has been a kind of inflection point that occurred in the last decade or so where we had enough computing power, it was cheap enough, and the connectivity and everything was there that we could have these unpermissioned chains and, and, and use proof of work, say, to control the consensus and it, that just wasn't technically feasible prior to that. And so, to my mind, a whole new idea, it was that we really had to wait till 
there was enough computing power out there and everything to, to do this. And that's the thing that made the world different, in my opinion. If you're holding a significant portion of your net worth in crypto, you're probably waiting for your portfolio to moon at any time. But holding crypto doesn't mean you should be irresponsible in the face of volatility risk. That's where Voltoro comes in. Voltoro is the leading gold hedging solution for the crypto community. And as a stable asset trusted for millennia, gold is the perfect long-term hedging solution. And at Epicenter, we've been using Voltoro since 2014 to protect a portion of our company's assets against volatility. Now, you might ask, why not use a stablecoin, Seb? Which is a great point, and don't get me wrong, stablecoins are great and a real benefit for crypto adoption. But algorithmic stablecoins are still a very new and experimental asset type, and some asset-backed stablecoins have been scrutinized for being under-reserved. With Voltoro, your gold is 100% insured and secured in vaults deep in the Swiss mountains protected by Brinks. Every single gram of gold is audited, and holdings are made transparently available on their website for anyone to verify. And most importantly, it's quite literally your gold. You can choose to have it delivered to you at any time. To learn more and to get access to Voltoro's brand new V2 platform, which includes an interface overhaul and trading in Dash, Litecoin, Ether, and Silver, go to voltoro.gold slash epicenter. That's V-A-U-L-T-O-R-O dot gold slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Voltoro for their support of the podcast. I want to come back maybe to uh, some, some earlier times. When you were at Berkeley and you were working on these things and people were getting arrested for printing the RSA algorithm and trying to get it across the border. And this, were, you, were, you, were you gravitating around those people? Like, did, did you know Mark Miller and like what he was up to and like all the other cypher, cypherpunks? And- yes, of, of course. And in some sense, I think the way that it's told is that I was the inspiration but behind the whole cypherpunk thing. However, you know, I wasn't really 100% on board with, let's say, the tactics that were kind of enlivening the movement, right? And so, you know, I wasn't a big fan of, like, automatic weapons and explosives and all this other stuff. I was more like, you know, maybe we could just get the pow- trick the powers that be into using stuff that would protect our privacy, and we'd be a lot better off because, like, going to war against them didn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I mean, it it was a real lot of fun to, you know, to be in a, in a movement thinking that you could actually, I don't know, do stuff like that. But uh, I didn't think that was uh, that realistic. It didn't prove to be that realistic. So I was really trying to affect the change and not just have fun doing so. So that's different. Do you have similar views about the way, you know, people working in the blockchain space now? And so you you were recently at Web3 Summit, like all... All these, all these young people now that are building these privacy technologies and, and sort of trying to, I guess, in, in some way fight the system. Do you feel similarly about their approach to trying to build permissionless technologies that can't be circumvented by governments, et cetera? Well, Sebastian, that's, that's a pretty deep question. And I'd like to say that, you know, I've been trying to make the world a better place for my whole career. And very often... I see a number of different avenues and approaches that you know my peers and colleagues uh, take, and there's a, a multi-factor evaluation that you have to make about each one. I mean, it, so is it an approach? Okay, yes, it's in the in a positive direction, but is it an approach that can go the full distance that's needed? What are the obstacles to that? Are those fundamental, or are those things that will just improve over time and over what time frame you expect that they will improve. So you have to kind of try to pick your best bet and sort of ride that out. If you're really serious about affecting change, if you're just trying to be happy with that you're doing something that isn't a bad thing or that's in a good direction, that's a different consideration. So I guess I'm, I try to be, I've tried to put some real thought into finding ways to actually do things that could really make a substantial difference. And uh, that makes me appreciate all the people that are working, but it doesn't mean that I wouldn't try to redirect their efforts if I thought that could work. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. It's like a pity to have to say so, I I would say, but this is, you know, I'm pretty serious about all this and I, I, I tend to try to, 
figure out what I think the best thing to do is. And the primary consideration is not about me personally. I get that. So the impact that you've made on cryptography is is really hard to overstate. So you you just just for the benefit of our listeners, so you invented blind signatures, um, undeniable signatures, group signatures. You invented mixes. You introduced the first predecessor to secret sharing. Um, and you jump-started the field of zero-knowledge proofs and probably many other things that I have neglected to uh, list now. Tying into what you said just earlier, which one of these do you think um, is going to become the most important to society and why? Well, let me answer an easier question first while I'm thinking about that. The most fundamental work is, you didn't mention, which is the multi-party computation work. And so in that work, there's a series of, of papers. So you could say that zero knowledge, which I was like on par with the, there's sort of two competing groups, the MIT group and my group. So we kind of had all three results at more or less the same time. And actually we, we ended up winning the best paper awards and getting the papers invited to the journals and stuff like that. But you, know, you, could, you could prove things to the world. That's like zero knowledge or minimum disclosure, which the two models that, that I proposed where the MIT people only had the zero knowledge model, then the computationally based multi-party computation work, and then there's the honest majority work. So those are two different full multi-party computation with, uh, models. And then the, the final thing that tied it all together was my work, and they didn't do, which is the, the spy master's double agent problem. You can see it on my website, tron.com. So this has the best of both worlds. If you have unlimited computing power, then you still have to have a majority in a, 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 a participants in order to defeat the security system. So this is um, uh, the real most fundamental stuff, but I'm really hoping that the two things that I'm focused on now can dramatically change the world. And I think it's become very clear that this stuff is really needed. And one is to, and you can see like on the Elixir, uh, home landing page, the the video up there, I'll explain a little more in detail, but basically the sort of messaging integrated with payments with dApps or mini apps in, in the same namespace has proven to be the killer app for consumers. You can see that by WeChat and what Facebook's tried to do and the other major uh, platforms in, in smaller markets. So this is like an indisputable fact. That's And it makes perfect sense. That's what people want. So if we can provide that, which is what my current company's dedicated to, in an unpermissioned manner that shreds the metadata in real time and has a very secure payment system that is comparable to the non-secured, to the other systems in terms of performance, user interface, so forth, and where we have a, a, an easy to build to DAP platform, then I think that is one of the two key things that's needed because that is, if you don't have a protected space where cons people can communicate with certainty that they're not being observed among their like friends and family and to obtain information about what's going on in the world and to support the collection and distillation information financially, if you don't have those protected spheres, you don't you cannot have meaningful democracy. And that's becoming, you know, unfortunately quite abundantly clear these days. We could come back to that. But uh, the other thing which I think is really fundamental and I'm very excited about, however, it, it's taken a little bit of a backseat right now because there's so much going on with the messaging and the payments the dap engine stuff that we're working on, but the new type of, of voting that I've proposed and that is we run binding elections with, which is called sample voting, is something that looks extremely promising to me because it allows direct democracy to scale with both the size and the complexity of society. And it's quite applicable for governance of, of our blockchain. And I think that will really demonstrate it. It will really shine there. But if you ask me what I think uh, might be the most important contributions, I think those 
those two and and they're interrelated right now. I'd like to ask you about something you, you mentioned a, a few times already, and that's about metadata. Why do you feel that metadata is so critical to the privacy and sovereignty of, of individuals? And because a lot of times people talk about their, their privacy, and I think they consider, they think about you know, the message, like, I don't want people to be able to read my message, but I don't think people really consider the importance of metadata. How, how would you effectively communicate that to someone that beyond the message that the, all the extra inferences that we can make about the metadata are as equally weaponizable, uh, I guess? Well, what I'd like to say is that back in the 80s and so forth, privacy was a kind of a freestanding issue. And I think in the last year or so, the public has come to recognize the significance of metadata as far as it's enabling the manipulation of public opinion and allowing for the sort of taking control of nation states in the democratic portions of the world. And this, you know, is just a, a fundamental and sort of irreversible phenomena. Whereas if you look at the sort of non-democratic portions of the world, you see that the same manipulation of, of media, social network, and so on is, is underway and diffusing any real hope of kind of a rise of public sentiment. Just look at the way China has manipulated mainland opinion related to the recent events in Hong Kong. It's, I was just reading about it. It's quite, quite stunning. And then that's sort of the carrot side. And then the stick side is, you know, there are people that are disappeared and their, you know, their access to their, their bank accounts is dis disconnected and so forth based on the surveillance of, of WeChat and, and so forth. So it's like this type of ferreting out who can be manipulated around which issues and, and manipulating the apparent will of the public online is something that's so powerful for almost all of the populations on the planet. It's, like I said, I think it's a profound and sort of irreversible danger, especially given the progress in artificial intelligence and sort of the immense amount of data that's already been kind of vacuumed up. This is fascinating, and I, we will definitely get back to this in a little bit, just before we do. And it's completely fine if you don't want to, but uh, would you mind disclosing how you protect your privacy online at the moment? It just because most of us, I mean, most of us use Google, and almost all of us at some point or other used to use Facebook, and I mean, Facebook's not such a thing anymore, but I mean, I, I know very few people who can actually live without Google and, you know, other big tech giants. And it's very difficult to protect yourself, right? And your privacy and your data. Like Linus Torvald, I have not been a user of social media. And there's a few things that come out, but it's not really for me, actually. But in any event, now that the Elixir platform is starting to become available, I really have no excuse not to use something that actually does uh, protect privacy and shred the metadata and so forth. So I'm going to start start to to become a user. I, that's about as much as I'd like to say about my own personal activities. Okay. So so you I mean you don't use Facebook or any social media anything like that. I I presume. Do you use uh, services like Google, um, like Gmail, or this sort of thing, or do you have some sort of you know personal opsec? process that uh, you've developed to uh, protect your privacy, but still have the ability to communicate you know, effectively with people? Like I said, I'm not a user of social media, but I will start using Elixir. And I try to make the best use of my personal energy to make the most effective change globally. And sometimes that means making compromises in terms of my own personal protection where I better put the energy into trying to come up with things that really can address the, the key issues and trying to find a way to get them out that seems attractive to, to the widest possible audience. I get that. I mean, we all, all have to make compromises at some point. I mean, like, so personally, in the last year or so, I've 
pretty much stop using any Google services for anything personal. Like I have my own mail server in my house. I've set all that up. I've, I, I, I use Signal with my family, but it, but it, it takes a lot of time, right? And I've invested maybe hundreds of hours in, in, in getting all this OPSEC uh, set up and everything and having products that appeal to the masses where you don't need to like know how to use Linux, for example, or you know, any, anything more complex than just installing an app is highly desirable. So in that context, something like Elixir, which we'll, we'll get to in, in a few minutes, I think fulfills that need uh, where it's a simple app that you install on your phone, like WhatsApp or anything like that. And people can use it just as they're used to using any, any sort of messaging app. One of the things that I found challenging uh, was getting friends and family to use the systems that I was using and that I thought would protect my privacy. So for example, I got my family and most of my friends that I talk to regularly with to use Signal. And Signal is sort of like an encrypted end-to-end -end encryption, open source version of WhatsApp, where there's still metadata, you know, presumably, but not under the Facebook umbrella, I guess. And so the challenge was getting people to use that. With something like Elixir, and some of the maybe the steps you've taken, how have you effectively communicated that with, you know, your friends and colleagues for them to start using this those systems where you're not, you know, using Facebook or WhatsApp or any any of these other uh, things that normal people use? I would say, like you know, people that are not so concerned about the privacy like like we are. Well, the history of social media, even though at any moment in time it looks like the most the dominant systems are never going to be displaced. The history proves that every few years there's a mass migration to the next best thing, and this has happened, you know, more than a half dozen times. And I believe that now the public has become quite disenchanted with the tech powers that be. They feel betrayed by the fact that they their data has been misused without their and without their permission, of course, and with such devastating consequences for like faith in in democracy and so on and so there is a huge opportunity at this moment which is to create an unpermissioned social media system which is a, a messaging which is all the new users basically interested in messaging integrated with payments like we chat and the rest as i've said with that supports dApps in the same namespace that is a, that shreds metadata in real time and that is free to users, the consumers, to ordinary people, and that has the capacity to scale to address a full out global use. So such a technology, which we are building and, and starting to roll out, has the ability to destroy what amounts to essentially a trillion dollars worth of market cap of these companies that have been exploiting the public secretly and creating this huge danger to society and to sort of give away for free to the public what it is they really want, which is these abilities to, to transact without being spied on. And there's interestingly no way that these major players can compete with such a thing because they are not unpermissioned. They are companies, and so they cannot shred the data, apparently, because governments seem to want to be able to force them to give it to them. So, and their business model is based on it. So we have this ability to dramatically change the whole landscape by creating an unpermissioned chain which offers this these kind of capabilities to the public for free. So I think that with the thought leaders and people like yourselves and, and your listeners on this podcast and so forth, this can provide the sort of initial critical mass that will then, because of the network effect, lead to a mass migration. And that can be a tremendously helpful thing for the future of, of, of the free world. Yeah, and these things, after they've Across a certain point, they permeate society way faster than one would, would have ever thought, right? I mean, basically, you get these major consensus narrative shifts um, where beforehand everyone had like one opinion and then everyone just kind of shifts more or less at the same time. And you get like 
you get this mass migration to a new thing. And I, I think you may be completely right in that we may be seeing that soon because people are being sensitized about what Facebook and the Facebooks of the world are doing. Uh, there recently a movie on Netflix came out, a documentary called The Great Hack. Mm. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. So basically, if you, dear listeners, haven't uh, seen it yet, um, it's totally worth a watch. It's about uh, Facebook and uh, how Cambridge Analytica used metadata to influence voting behavior. It's very scary. So it's very dystopian. And, and I'd just like to point out that if you were to just look into it a bit, you'd see that Cambridge Analytica, by its own admission, has been active in most of the large democracies around the globe. And there are dozens of other companies which seem to be apparently pursuing similar business models and similar approach. So it's not something that's going to go away. It's only quite surprising to me that it even became you know, known to the, to the general public. It's quite a sea change that we're witnessing. Yeah. I want to go into your solution for this problem a little bit later on in the show. But let's talk about your first company first. Um, so your first company was Digicash. Can you tell us when, when you got the idea for Digicash and uh, how it actually worked? Sure. Well, in 1982, I published a little paper on blind signature-based payments. And then in the, the mid-90s, I was run, running a research group, one of the top research groups in the world on cryptography. And the Dutch government, and it was in Amsterdam and the Netherlands, and the Dutch government came to us and said, we want to do a road toll system here in, in the Netherlands, but we don't want the government to be able to know where everyone is driving. And so we're wondering, is it possible to have like a smart card based automatic road toll collection system, you know, with the radio transponders, just like you, we see around the world today, but where the identity of the vehicles is not disclosed, but the payments are, are made and the, the pricing varies during the day. And I said, well, that's funny. You should ask, you know, I actually <laughs> invented something in 1982 that could do that. And they said, oh, well, really? Well, I mean, would it be fast enough? You know, like at 100 kilometers an hour, the radio connection only exists for a, about a meter of road travel. So that's not a lot of time to complete a payment. And I said, oh, yeah, I think we could do it. And they said, oh, really? Well, I said, yeah, well, tell you what, if, if we can do it in two weeks, will you give us a contract to build it? If we could prove to you that we could do it in two weeks, and they said, sure. So I got a bunch of... Uh, students and we like wired up this house uh, and it was a crash project and in about 10 days I actually built a little hardware gizmo that used the same kind of microcontroller as in a smart card of 6805 and uh, we demonstrated that we could make these blind signature payments in a special way at that kind of speed and so they gave us the contract and so we had to build it and so I hired the students and uh, we started building it. And uh, this was uh, done on like the same campus as my research group, but it was in a, in a separate facility. And eventually, as the web started to emerge, I, I moved over to actually uh, run the company. So from there, this was kind of the inception uh, of Digicash. And so Digicash was used to manage this toll payment system. Well, they never built the road toll systems, <laughs> actually. Ah, okay. But that wasn't because our part didn't work. We partnered with a company called Amtech, and we demonstrated it and, and everything. But the government, I guess, got cold feet that it's really interesting. But I think you can get a lot of insight and perspective from their big fear was that if they built this, that people would in mass ignore it and like just not pay. And even though they would have photographs of all the cars and stuff, there'd be such a mass opposition to it that it would erode the power of government. It would, it would be extreme embarrassment to them. So that was, I think, why they decided not to do it in the end. Because, I mean, the Dutch, Dutch don't like to pay for anything. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so how was Digicash put to use then? Well, 
1994, I gave one of two keynotes, and it was the first keynote at the World Wide Web Conference. It was the first World Wide Web Conference in Geneva. And what I did, and this in those days, it was, you know, the, we used a web browser to make the slide presentations, right? And this was projected by, in those days, it was a huge projector. And I made the first eCash payment from, and it was from there, Geneva to Amsterdam, and launched this idea that a number could be worth money, a so-called digital bearer instrument, and launched our the DigiCash company, really. And this was picked up by all kinds of media around the world. Within a couple of days, there was a lot of interest in the idea that a number could be worth money, a digital bearer instrument. And so we were very much in the spotlight and we kind of started with the first thing, which was uh, called the Cyberbucks. And this is like a a digital currency as currently understood, but different in a few ways. So one commonality is that it, it had a limited amount of the currency that was going to ever be issued. So that was a, uh, an interesting and a good innovation. The another thing was that you know, of course, all the the, the the transactions were conducted online. It differs technically from current blockchain, which have you know, arguably zero privacy, right? Whereas Digicash used the blind signature concept which you mentioned earlier, so that has a really nice special kind of privacy, which sometimes is called one-way privacy or payer anonymity, which is essentially that only the person who forms the digital coin initially at random, to be the, the user, can recognize it later. So it's hidden by a blinding process when it receives the validating signature by the issuer so that when the use, user receives it back, they can unblind it and spend it, and everyone can see that it's really signed and then they just have to check for the double spending, but that digital coin is unlinkable to the withdrawal process where it was originally signed. So what it amounts to is that as the payer, you can always irrefutably prove who received the money from you, but they cannot find out who you are. And that, it turns out, is the kind of an ideal kind of privacy because at the time of what's called the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, the Central Bank, Central Bank, proclaimed that criminal use of payments could be divided into three types, extortion, black markets, and bribery. And if you think about it, such a one-way privacy is makes the, the money unsuitable for any criminal use because, you know, what kidnapper would accept payment by check or, you know, what politician would accept a bribe by, you know, wire transfer or... You know, in a black market, it's always you sort of follow the money up the hierarchy. So it was quite unique. And so what this means is that each coin has a f- one of a fixed set of denominations, unlike current blockchain, where that is in, in effect a digital check system, where each transfer has a potentially unique amount, which links it horizontally from account to account, from wallet ID to wallet ID. With, with DigiCash, each one cent or two cent, four cent, eight cent, we use the binary denomination scheme, just is a little more efficient. But each, each such denomination has its own type of signature and its own sort of freestanding digital bearer instrument that's kind of like a containerized, a discretized version of money that prevents the or reduces, let's say, the horizontal traceability from from let's say, from account to account to account, so that because of the standardization of uh, and the sort of breaking the, the payments up in, into, just like paper money and coins today, metal coins. So another uh, difference uh, of, of the, uh, the DigiCash uh, technology. Let's talk about security. You know, dApps are pretty unique because unlike other types of software, they can hold astronomical amounts of value. That's why getting systems audited, creating robust security processes, and fostering a culture of security in your organization is so important. And to do this, you should only trust experts with real security expertise. There are a lot of security firms in the blockchain space, 
but few have the experience and track record of Trail of Bits. And they've been in business since 2012, long before things like the DAO hack were even imaginable. Trail of Bits works with your team to audit every aspect of your project. And smart contract code is just the beginning. They'll help you implement best practices around things like DevOps, key storage, and user-facing applications. And once your software has been rigorously tested and reviewed by Trail of Bits, they'll provide the tools you need to make sure that your code remains safe over every new commit. They can even put a software security expert at your team's disposal who will give you advice and answer your questions when you need them. It's like having your own security engineer on staff. But don't take my word for it. Go to their publications repo on GitHub to read their papers, presentations, and security reviews. It's no wonder teams like Parity, Status, New Cipher, and organizations like Facebook and DARPA trust Trail of Bits for their security audits. To learn more, go to trailofbits.com, and if you decide to reach out, make sure you let them know you heard about them on Epicenter. We'd like to thank Trail of Bits for their support. So who are the users of Digicash? Were, were there sort of classes of people that you, you could kind of say were using this? Was it mostly for online purchases or were there certain use cases that you were starting to kind of pick up on when, when, uh, when it started getting traction? Well, so those initial payments were part of the Cyberbucks. You could call it today an airdrop. So basically we said, we're only going to issue this amount and we will give it away for free but our condition on that was that you have to, to create a shop, an online web-based shop that accepts Cyberbucks for something. And then we would give you like 100 Cyberbucks. And that's how we rolled it out. And if you go to charm.com, you can see sort of the eCash Museum. You can see all the press releases and so on. You can actually see the icons of a lot of the shops that uh, were up uh, issuing selling things for, for eCash and that participated in the Cyberbucks, let's say, launch of, of eCash. But then we also subsequently licensed banks around the world to issue eCash in their national currency at the time, as well as for internal use. So like Nomura Securities, they used it internally, but we had issuers in most uh, most continents. So we had Australian dollars, we had US dollars, we had, uh, in those days it was pre Euro, so this would be the Deutschmark, and then a number of other licensees in, in Scandinavia and so forth. So actually, Deutsche Bank in those days was like the biggest bank in, in Europe, indisputably, and they were our like toughest customer. They had a data center that was in an old bunker underground and they wanted every kind of industrial audit backup, you know, roll up in every kind of protection and, and everything. And so we had to build all that stuff for them and they, they deployed it. And there were shops that accepted payments by eCash Deutschmarks. And so they were very enthusiastic about it. And so they were like moving forward and, and as were, you know, so there was a lot of interest in the, in this technology and the, in the product. From a lot of perspectives, but you know the web was growing very, very rapidly in those days. And uh, I don't know if you recall, but people were reluctant to make payments using their credit cards because you know. But e-commerce was projected as as you know something that was was going to happen, and so it was just uh, it was very difficult to deploy. It was somewhat of a labor of love to install an eCash client in your computer in those days and keep it up to date and and, and so forth. So it was. Uh, Interesting times. I remember back in, in, in my mid-teens in the late 90s wanting to buy some, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to order like an SSH server or something. And the only way to do it was to pay online. And of course, I didn't have a credit card as a teenager. So I, I, I asked my mom if I could use hers. And she's like, I'm not putting my credit card number online. Are you crazy? So what she ended up doing, she got an extra credit card with like a, a $500 limit just so that I could buy stuff online. And, uh, you know, so you having something like like Digicash back then would have been very useful um, or, or something like obviously like Bitcoin or something like that uh, uh, also. But so, so Digicash was backed by by actual reserves, right? Like there was U.S. dollars or Deutsche Bank or something in a bank account representing these uh, individual coins, correct? A handful of banks around the world which issued eCash and what that technically meant was that if you had an account at their bank, 
then you could withdraw money from your account into eCash, just like you could visit an ATM machine and withdraw it into paper money. So you could load up your eCash wallet from your bank account, and then you could spend that money, up, but it was in the form of these binary denominated digital bearer instruments that all of our payments were privacy protected in that way as a, with blind signatures, and you, you could spend it at any of the uh, shops that w- were online to accept it. So it strikes me that this is kind of similar to you know a lot of some of the the asset backed stable coins that we see in the space now, and in some way I mean, put, setting aside all the privacy issues, etc. But in some way, it is a little bit uh, similar to what Facebook has proposed in Libra and that cryptocurrency. Would, would, would you not say so? Well, the way I frame it is that we issued a freestanding digital currency, Cyberbox, and we had a way to get it ex- accepted at a lot of merchants, and we gave it away. So we were trying to create our own currency with a bounded cap. And in parallel with that, we allowed others to issue their own versions of it, and we helped them do that. And those others all turned out to be banks, or I think there were also, like, the Mura was a research organization, and I think the Sweden Post licensed it. So there are people that want to use it beyond uh, other than banks, but we try to make it available to anyone who wanted to use it, but in those days, uh, we had to help them do it. And so we wanted this stuff to be come like the digital currency, but there was such a rapid growth and a hesitation and then lurch forward of growth, and it was not anywhere near as convenient as like credit cards once that became a viable option. So so as a matching a private person, if, if I accept your eCash, What's my route to redeeming it for fiat? Can I do that with any bank or just my bank? Or how does it work? Back in the in the DigiCash days, there were banks that accepted eCash in different currencies and would were willing to convert them, like exchanges. So there was a bank called Mark Twain Bank in the US. They issued US dollars, but they would also accept other currencies and, and convert. So the only way that you could get, let's say, into or out of fiat was through a bank account that was denominated in that fiat currency and that was was provided by a bank that was actually part of the eCash system. And so basically the banks within the eCash system, they then settled amongst themselves? I think it was a little simpler than that, but more or less, yeah. I mean, they they had just like if you don't understand how national banking works, I mean, they had accounts at, at correspondent banks and so on. Okay, I see. Um, and what was the business model of eCash? You mean you meant the, the business model of the company DigiCash? Yeah, e- exactly. So basically, how was DigiCash meant to make money? Well, DigiCash did make money, and I mean, we did the Cyberbox thing for free, and we hope to really foster the creation of a, an alternative currency based on a you know pretty idealistic vision for that. But we also uh, licensed banks and other organizations that I mentioned. And, and for that, you know, they paid us for the right to do it and paid us to help them. And we had, a, I think, a, a sound and sustainable business model. But then as the web really started to take off, we deci- I decided that this technology was too important to not be given a chance to really rise with the tide. So we took in a substantial investment, and I think the strings attached to that, in the end, didn't really have the same interest in making the world a better place. So that was a decision I made to because you know it was put very clearly internally, you know, we could have just kept on keeping on in a modest way. And that would have been much safer for us. And that would have been fine. And like, you know, you mentioned business model in your question, but I decided that we should really just go for trying to make the world a better place and try to rise with the the tide. So we took in a fair amount of money under 
terms that assume that those people who put the money in really had the same concern about changing the world as us. But in the end, that didn't prove to be the case. Let's get back to uh, this topic that has been following us through this conversation, which is Elixir. Uh, so it's your current project. Uh, so can you give us a high level overview of what is Elixir and what's the goal here? Like, what, what are you trying to achieve with this new project? Elixir aims to be a free to consumers messaging and payments platform that is second to none in terms of privacy because it's unique in its ability to shred the metadata to provide the kind of transaction speeds that people are accustomed to and has the capability to scale the, the bandwidth that's needed for mass adoption and that also allows for the integration of dApps and in that way positions itself as a, a full alternative to the WeChat or a, a Facebook with Libra or some of these other offerings and, and I believe a very attractive alternative. And with the network effects, we can expect like perhaps a, a very rapid transition. That sounds uh, super exciting. And uh, we, we are doing an episode especially on Elixir in the near future. So like an entire hour dedicated to this topic. It seems to me that maybe we're at some sort of turning point. Uh, I mean, basically, the, the past couple of years or the past couple of decades have been, you know, an arms race between people who are interested in surveillance and surveilling people, nation states and other actors, and uh, people who are developing ways to preserve your privacy. Would you agree with this? And um, what do you think the possible um, outcomes are here? So what's, what's the possibility space that you anticipate? Well, I wouldn't characterize the past couple of decades as an arms race between governments and, let's say, good intention developers. But rather, unfortunately, it's a pity to have to say so, but I think that there have been a lot of kind of honeypots set up that lured good intention people into using systems that were a little bit hard to use, but actually simply revealed them as people who were concerned about their privacy. And if you look at things like the Arab Spring, so-called, or other kinds of movements. So it's always pretty surprising how easily all the leaders are identified and eventually arrested and or whatever disappeared. And it recently was revealed that China also has the what Snowden told us the US government has sort of the full take the, the ability to surveil the entire network and what that means, of course, is that Tor is simply a transparent to both of these major power groups. And, you know, similarly, a lot of other good intention things turned out not to really be adequate solutions. So, you know, I think that we're we're in a at a really great point because all that good work and intention and so on has resulted in a, a culture of an understanding of a lot of these issues at a technical level by developers and so on, a real interest to see this happen. So we've got a lot of momentum. And now with the ability to do unpermissioned chains and with some of the technology breakthroughs that I've been working on to try to you know speed up some of this stuff and so forth, like we have a thousand X speed up in, in mixing with Elixir, right, which is needed for chat. With the parallel realization by the public, in effect, this is the whole game. If you cannot have a protected sphere, then you've lost control over governance, and that may be something that's very difficult to recover. So I think it's now we're, we're at a you know, really exciting uh, point in this, in, this, uh, in this process. I'm glad you're optimistic about this because my my views on this stuff has have become slightly tainted over the last couple of years, and I've become more pessimistic about it. I feel that these platforms 
have gained so much power and they've gained power for a couple of reasons. But one of the reasons that they become powerful is because, well, obviously they connect people, right? Like people want that connection. But I think that they also exploit very primitive aspects of what makes us human. So I believe there's you know, quite a few studies out there that talk about kind of like how Facebook and Instagram and like so the, the like culture affects um, like neuroreceptors in our brains and like how they accurately hit our, our pleasure receptors, et cetera. Uh, and it, it's almost like an exploit, right? It's almost like these platforms are exploiting our brains like some, some malware. And I, I think for platforms that try to, you know, do the right thing and, and not like use people's data to exploit their privacy and their voting uh, habits and like, you know, get them to buy stuff. All those people that are on the other side doing like the right thing. I think that they maybe also need to try to approach this with that same malware approach, but like the white hat version of that, right? Like what's the white hat version of like the Facebook like button that, or like the Instagram like button that just gets you coming back all the time, but, but doesn't, you know, exploit you as a user. And I think that the space of like good intention people haven't yet figured out what the white hat version of that is. And, and I, I really hope that um, people like you and, and the folks working on, on Elixir and other products like it, you know, get to figure that out and, and get to create that, that massive network effect that topples Facebook and like makes it the next MySpace. You know what I mean? But in principle, there's not a reason why you shouldn't be able to build that. Yes, that's right. That's what we... What I proved back in the, in the late 80s, what the multi-party computation results prove is that if there's any way to create a white hat incentivization, a reward scheme that doesn't inherently exploit data, then cryptography can allow for it to be realized securely and transparently. Do you feel that DAOs have a place in this, in the governance of these protocols? Well, I think that, yes, it's, it's essential that there is a kind of democratic structure that controls this infrastructure. And that's, as I mentioned earlier, one of the two key ingredients. I think you need protected spheres and you need a kind of democracy that scales with the complexity and size of of the system. Those two ingredients together, that can solve it. I think those are nice last words. <laughs> Maybe this is a good point to end this episode. It was a great pleasure to have you on. We talked about this before the episode. We'll have you on again very soon when you're ready to talk about Elixir, your platform and blockchain that runs on it, uh, Praxis. Great. Yeah, well, this was really a blast and interesting, and I appreciate you know your, your question is interesting and your and your thoughts and uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, David. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter Podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.